Um, and uh, yeah, so we're, we're back again today. We are um, joined with uh, Duncan and Tony again from CSM. And uh, we are doing the second uh, dry demo. So I think some of you may have joined us last week where we did, uh, Tony and Duncan did their dry demos as well. And Duncan did a, a sort of expansive overview of slip for decoration. And Tony did a more in depth uh, dive into sledging plaster. Um, so this time, uh, the roles are going to be reversed a little bit, and Tony's going to do an overview of plaster, and Duncan's going to dive into slip decoration, um, a specific one. And along with uh, all the other interruptions that we're having, um, we've somehow messed up Duncan's Zoom account. So he's zooming through his phone and uh, all not, the his slideshow on my end. You've not messed it up, you've deleted it. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, we took it, we took his uh, Zoom away from him. So uh, we're going to do <laughs> our best. The best. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll uh, just turn it over to you, you two, um, if you want to say anything before we get started. Um, was it you first, Duncan? I've lost it. No, you, you, you kick off and then I'll, I'll end it with the slip. You know, you're asking me to kick off. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. No, that's not, 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 not that in way. those terms. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, good evening, Mr. Quinn. Good evening, Tony. Uh, how are you doing? We're good. Yeah. So it's, it's 7 p.m. here in London. Um, I'm not entirely sure what time it is in the U.S. But um, so, yeah. I'm uh, Tony Quinn. I'm the head of ceramics at Central St. Martins, and Duncan is my colleague who ably runs our first year. Um, so Thank the, you. Plan, the plan, yeah, <laughs> I don't often say that. <laughs> um, so the plan is that I will uh, give a sort of brief uh, race through the sort of potential um, plaster demonstrations that we might do. This sort of mirrors what Duncan last week would slip and surface decoration, and then Duncan will do a more in-depth uh, presentation. Um, and I'm going to do it by sharing my screen, and um, all will become evident if you weren't here last time. Um, actually, let's share the screen first. Okay, so you got PowerPoint. You can see this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, a couple of years ago, me and Duncan wrote this book together called The Workshop Guide to Ceramics. So the purpose of us sort of this idea of a dry demo, both I and Duncan are sort of isolated at home without access to a workshop. But we have actually um, got a lot of, we've done a lot of work together and a lot of preparation, step-by-step uh, -step demonstrations in this book that is available online. We don't get any money from it, so it's entirely up to you whether you buy it or not. But this is just co this is just covering us. <laughs> like, cause we, we're actually hacking our own copyright at the moment. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how Thames and Hudson's and Barons feel about that. But hopefully they're not allowed in the room, so it shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, um, so we've just chosen two fairly chunky sections that we'll go through over a, f a number of sessions. Um, uh, so I'm going to sort of talk about how to go from sort of clay maquette or like plaster or paper maquettes to plaster modeling and into sort of slip casting or press molding. Um, the, um, these are just pages photographed from the book. Uh, so we're literally working, this is the idea of a dry demo, we're working direct from the book. Um, so I'll go through... Um, in future, I'll go through in quite detail, literally the sort of lexicon, you know, like how we sort of talk about um, the words we use in the process. Because the interesting thing about this in English, the sort of plaster lexicon relates to the idea of a ceramic industry. And specifically in the UK, the industry is based around Duncan's hometown, Stoke on Trent. Um, and so a lot of the sort of uh, traditional language is quite um, sort of colloquial. And so there's a sort of specific glossary we need there to understand it. Um, so we'll talk about that and we'll talk about how to 
do simple things like mix plaster. A lot of people are taught through a sort of art approach, which means that they'll sort of do things like put a sort of bucket of plaster and water and make a mountain. And actually that's just like, that's a very uh, quick way of doing it, but it's not particularly the most accurate. And if we're going to do things like casting, we need to have an accurate process from the start. So we have to sort of measure the plaster and mix it to accurate ratios, particularly if we're making two or three part molds, because we don't want different porosity in each side. So we'll go through very much the basics. And then we'll talk about how to make models. In this case, this is a converted wood lathe, um, turning a plaster model. Um, um, Actually, that's in reverse order. Look, I threw this together. So, look, that's the end of the process. That's the start of the process. Um, but yeah, so um, how to sort of sense the plaster, how to mix the plaster, how to turn to a profile and turn it accurately, uh, how to center up. So, here we have this uh, surface gauge and we're sort of making a center line in order to make an <coughs> accurate mold later on, um, how to make profiles. Um, you know, there's that. those three se sections are completely universal. So make the profile, uh, center the plaster using this profile here to sort of check the accurate and then finishing and leaving a seam on the plaster. Um, also, go things, through things like sledging. In this case, I did a sledging demo last week, but this one here is sledging over a jig. This is a really cool process because here yeah, you basically make a sort of um, um, wooden template, wooden template, and then perspex templates, and drag the tool over the soft plaster, and then refine the surface, and eventually you make one half of the model here. So this is in sort of zoom, uh, zoomed in. Excuse the pun. Um, and then we would repeat this, and would have a quite a complex form. Um, so this is uh, interesting approach here we've got um, sort of uh, what we call bench sledging so producing a length this is work by Stephen Graham which sort of exemplifies this this sort of multi-layered form and then this is work by Glitherow a really cool design duo English and Dutch and they sort of sledge the bench in situ using a, a large scale using an armature the traditional way um, so this is all sort of examples of how this process would work um, and then we have sort of typologies of work in because model mold making tends to lead towards slip casting or press molding. But what it offers is accuracy. This is a um, interlocking vase which you can just extend the height by designed by Damien Evans. This all relies on the fact that things interlock uh, due to the accuracy of the molding process. This is my work for a company called Leeds Pottery in the UK. And this is sort of uh, steamers for it. So the benefits really is talking about the um, that sort of industrial accuracy that you get with model and mold making. Uh, this work of Simon Stevens. Um, again, sort of cast work. Also look at things like making, you know, taking start to finish making a teapot in plaster. So here we've got sort of modeling the spout, how you go through that, how you accurately form it with serve uh, forms and again you can see all of this sort of use of templates and tools which bring the accuracy uh, and then similar process here modeling a handle so cutting again template cutting out plaster bath forming it going all the way through the process even using a vernier surface uh, vernier gauge to check the um, section of the handle um, and then also looking at different sorts of ways of, again, this sort of lexicon. Uh, and then um, here, this is when, how to use a spur. People often misuse, misuse a spur and use it um, in a very inaccurate way. So this is sort of talking about different types of spur. Um, people often tend to use the plug in a really inaccurate sort of way and it would be much better to sort of make two parts and assemble them and use a plug, which is a very sort of sloppy ad hoc approach and should be used sparingly. So we'll sort of get to that sort of level of accuracy, hopefully. Um, and then we'll look at mold making. This is the work of Marita Chula. Um, he's a really cool artist and designer based in Poland, uh, formerly based in the US, actually, sort of. Pratt for a long time. 
Um, and then going through so again some basic stuff like what a seam is, and here we got mixing a making a plaster bat, which is a sort of the workhorse of um, of the sort of mold making process. So here we have the sort of plaster bat and making it accurate and flat, and then it's sort of being cut up here, and the setting up of the model in the mold, playing up the sort of seam, building the box around it, and sort of working through the mold making process. Then through to casting, um, so sort of how to slip cast. You know, one of the things I'm always struck by in sort of ceramics is we always have a glazed recipe book, but we don't, well, people tend not to do sort of casting book, but actually that you need the same sort of rigor. There's no point sort of slip casting and not knowing how long it should be in the mold and how, or when you should demold or how much volume of slip you need or how much. Um, especially when you get into sort of producing your own work for sort of for retail, it's important to know what volume of clay is used in the object because that's a sort of cost. So that's what this sort of book sort of describes here. And they go through to assembling cast parts. So here we've got a handle and a cup, and how to assemble them and fettling. Again, it's one of these. Each one of these stages is important to discuss because. Uh, the whole endeavor of the mold making process is trying to build accuracy. And then if we don't sort of use an accurate process, there's really, there's really no point in doing it. If we're not going to use an accurate process, uh, we should have used a more sort of expressive process like throwing, which, you know, which is, can actually be done accurately. But I suppose my point is there's really no point doing model mold making without the accuracy because then you could have used a more expressive route, like handmade route. Um, and then we can even get through to uh, jollying. So here we've got sort of ring and frame and how to make a plate mold, and then how to uh, uh, jig it on the machine. So this again, uh, if you call it the same in the US actually, but in the UK it's the machine is called a jigger jolly, and you jolly hollow forms and you jigger flat forms. Uh, again, I'm not entirely sure <laughs> where the the language comes from other than it's associated with the historical industry of the UK. I think that's everything. Yes, that's my race through the potential of what we could do in uh, in uh, the plaster route. Uh, Tony, really quick, uh, a while ago you had me send you pictures of our Jigger Jolly setup. Was oh, that the because, wheel, yeah. Was that because we were doing something wrong or was it just a funny setup? No, no, it's quite cool because the, the reason we did that was because uh, we, it, it, ordinarily we would not be fooling around online. Um, in a month from now, we would be working together in uh, a New York Design Week, uh, once a design festival down in um, Industry City. And we were, we were, because we were doing this idea of sort of convivial ceramics, we were looking at making plates. So we were interested in whether we could make plates on site. Okay. As opposed to having the huge machine that we, you know, the industrial machine. So I'd seen your video, I think it was on Instagram, and I was like, hey, the, Gus and Anders have got a tool we could make plates on site. Yeah. So it yeah, wasn't we, that you were doing it wrong, it was a sort of potential. <laughs> yeah. We should get a Sarah, our technician, involved to do a Jigger Jolly demo with you guys. Oh, yeah. Cool. Hands at her over the internet. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that's, is she good at the, She's the, she's the best one in our studio. So cool. Well, then we should get, I don't know if he's on here, but we should get Ian because uh, I, although I'm, I know the principal, I've done it a long time ago, but I now tend to design it and other people make it. But our colleague Ian McIntyre is pretty much the expert at our end. So those two can sort of like yeah. work together. Yeah, I want to talk to him. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, and for everybody, in the United States, here's here's the U.S. version of their book that they're referencing. Um, cool. Does anybody else have anything for Tony? Um, okay, Duncan, I'm gonna pull your your talk up here.
Oh, we've got someone trying to join. Uh, oh, we had someone, Sarah Howard. Yeah, I yeah, she's that. she's a student of ours. Yeah. Okay. Honors, if you see her pop up again, will you add her? I just I just added her. Oh, she's on the list now. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm I'm having a few technical issues, as you know, um, since the, since the last meeting with Claire and Linda. Um, so anyway, good evening. I'm Duncan Houston. Um, stage one working with Tony at Centre St. Martins. And last week I gave an overview of, um, of slip decoration, the potential of it, because the book covers at least 10 to 15 pages to get people thinking about the surface before or as soon as they've made something to actually get people to think about the surface while they're in that moment of, of actually making. Um, because obviously we, we're attracted to ceramics because of its potential over different stages of the process. So one of those important things for me is to get people to think about how they're going to finish it while they're actually making the object or at least have that response to it. Um, and the way this is going to work, hopefully for some reason, because I'm doing this on my phone, my phone is running out of battery as we speak, even though I've um, linked it into the charger. But so we'll see how long this lasts for. Speak if fast, I go, if, I go, if, I, if it goes blank, it's for that reason. Um, so slide one is just the basic introduction into the book. And then slide two. Um, so as I mentioned the slides, um, Gus, if you could roll them up, that'd be great. Okay. Um, slide two, there's an artist there called Tony Laverick, uh, who's built a very strong studio practice. And he uses slip all the time. It's, it's one of the fundamentals for him. So as soon as he's made a form, he's very active with the surface. And he produces some extraordinary surfaces with slip, but then also starts to add glaze and then also lusters. So he's a bit like, well, he's not at all like Grayson Perry, but he's like Grayson Perry in the sense that he treats the surface of the object, whether it's a pot or sculpture, um, each stage of the process. So he's engaging with it in its raw, straight, in its raw state, in, it, in its real kind of wet stages, interacting with that surface again, that response to what's happening in front of him with the drying of the clay. So catching the clay at different moments. Um, and really kind of responding at every single stage, the bisque stage, and then once it's glazed and fired with enamels and lusters. Um, so really th this page is just showing how to go about making your own slip, your own colored slip, and always starting from dry materials. I'm a great believer in that if you want to re be able to repeat something, that result, because we, as we know, we can be very experimental with things uh, when we're making, but particularly with surface treatment and glazes, if you can record accurately, it means that you're gonna be able to repeat that surface or that effect again. So taking materials back to the raw state and then adding stains so you know what percentage weight wise you need of that particular stain. And again, all stains vary, um, but really understanding that it is a recipe to be followed. Um, slide three deals with really the consistency of slip. So for each of these techniques that, and, and again, like Tony was saying, we'll go through a variety of different techniques. What I'm talking about this evening is very much about how you start to approach the surface when it's just been made and it's just starting to dry out. So the idea of brushing things onto the surface or rolling or spraying onto the surface. So it's important, as Tony mentioned, with plaster, really, you can use plaster in lots of different consistencies and um yeah the phone's actually my phone's running out of battery very quickly but um it's one of those things to say that the consistency of slip the consistency of slip is super important to actually the results you're going to achieve with it so recording it any way that makes sense to you but dipping your finger into it checking the consistency and then you know that's the material you can then work with. Um, slide four, two people I mentioned very quickly last week, Simon Carroll on the left, 
and Dan Wright on the right hand side. Um, two potters I know and knew very well because Simon sadly died a number of years ago. Um, but they each use slip to really enhance the surface at that immediate stage, that first stage. And what we'll also do, what we're also going to experiment with Gus and Anders is some demonstrations they can perform in the studio so that we can talk them through the consistency of things and how to approach things. So as if Tony and myself were teaching students, but without the hands-on um, capability. So Simon, again, used mainly slip and then some glaze. Didn't really touch a third firing like decals or lusters. But really what he did was, because um, he was one of my first students at Bristol when I was technical demonstrator there, I showed him some various techniques where you can enhance the surface of just dragging the brush across. And that's something very much within my own work I've done throughout my practice, throughout my career. Um, Dan Wright was a student alongside me in Bristol. Um, and he, with that image on the right, if we go to the next slide, um, slide number five, you'll see some of the qualities Dan achieves just by thickness of slip. So use, always using terracotta clay, um, and then different applications, different layers of slip to really start, as a painter would, responding to what's in front of them. So with this, you can see at the top, um, that lighter area, obviously the black slip at the top, and then this lighter area, where he's just lightly, lightly brushing the surface, but again, understanding the thickness of the slip um, to a thicker coat below that, and then waiting for that to dry a little, and then he can put that yellow, that ochre brush mark onto the surface. And when you look at the work, it's all about the quality of surface. You're always in that kind of constant conversation with the surface. Um, both of them, Simon, I just thought it was a good contrast, very abstract, so he's really throwing the slip at it, also brushing it across, introducing some oxides into that. Um, Dan, a bit more control, so treating it like almost like a graphic artist in that way. And then he knows he's going to put these, these other black lines on with the slip, but then the contrast with the decal on the third firing. Um, is for me what makes that work stand out. It shows the quality of mark making in all its kind of glory in a way. Um, slide six is some functional work of Dan's where there he's sponging the slip on those circles. They're very subtle. Um, and then a student on the right hand side, the bowl is made by a student responding to some of Dan's work that I took in um, to show this demonstration. What's so lovely about that is that Yoka's bowl, you see the start and the end of a brush mark. So it's that thing about capturing that moment, like in abstract expressionism, where you capture that moment of contact, that contact that then is dragged across or drawn through um, and really making full use of that. Um, you know, he, he, what Yoka did with this was actually put it on the wheel and activated the wheel quite slowly, but then just held the brush on and then went back to it, those three lines. So really it's about the attention to detail of surface. And obviously what slip with the mug on the left, with Dan's mug, um, what he's able to do then is once he's put the slip on, brushed it on, this undercoat of white, he's then able at the end just to clean it all up and have the terracotta clay coming through. So again, you're understanding the clay underneath as well. So it's not to hide the clay. Um, slip number, uh, slide number seven, um, Al Qasadi, who uses slip all the time and also body, different body stains, um, but draws the, the, the color onto plaster and then rolls slaps onto, uh, slabs of clay onto the plaster to pick up that color. So again, for me, that's a really interesting way of really starting the technique even before she's made the form. She's thinking about the surface and then dealing with the form. Um, and so it's that thing about, okay, which comes first? But those forms couldn't have been decorated almost in any other way. You know, Duncan. Close. Hello? Um, sorry, it's Tony. Um, uh, what, yeah. What's the consistency of the slip on the plaster to pick it up? It's fair. I mean, what's beautiful about that is, is that um, you can have it at different consistencies. So what she'll do, there's somebody called Zoe, uh, she left the Royal College a few years ago. 
forgotten the name. So he, it'll come back to me. Um, but almost from a watercolour perspective or a watercolour consistency through to almost when you put the, the brush onto the plaster bat, it's almost starting to drag. But what that does, it enables you to paint the picture, if you like, or paint the surface on, the, on a flat surface. And then once you lay the, um, lay the clay on, it's going to pick up all that, that texture that you've created on the plaster bat. Um, what Zoe showed me when she was demonstrating was actually she soaks the plaster before she lays the slip on so it doesn't drag too much. Um, so yeah, otherwise it dries out too quickly. But again, as, as we know, Tony, years and years of doing anything informs the quality of the work. And it's that thing we, we talk about all the time, about embodied knowledge. Um, it doesn't come the first, second or third time. And as I'll explain in a minute with my own work, it was, it was one technique, um, which is shown on the next slide, that I've always been attracted to. So it's this thing about brushing across a surface, but using different thicknesses of slip to achieve almost like, um, if you think of how transparent marble is, so when you're looking at alabaster or marble, you know, there's a depth of surface and you can create that so easily with slip. And again, when I, when I started first using slip, it was a thing that I didn't, I, I was kind of, I, I was very much a purist about the clay. I wanted the clay surface to show it all. And then as we know, when it dries, it looks fairly ugly or there's no, the life almost has gone out of it. Um, and so for me, I was trying to find an equivalent. I didn't find it with glaze. I found it with using clay on clay, if you like. So it was this thing about drawing out the qualities of the surface that I made. I'm very much on throne work. So very quickly when I started throwing, I started mark making into the clay. And then it was how, how would I enhance that with something else? And I found by brushing over at different consistencies, that it started to pick up and change the actual quality of the line. So, you know, I'm talking to students about the sorts of materials you use when you're drawing, Ch you know, chop and change, test different things out. What gives you the mark, the speed of mark, you know, the, the speed at which your brush operates across this surface and trying different ways um, really to explore the quality of just a single material in a brush. Um, and obviously, if you see great calligraphers, they're often using the same brush, but the thickness to the thin tip uh, is extraordinary to see that use. And again, the repetitive mark making of things. Um, and so for me, I was really drawn in my own practice um, with slide nine. Um, after rather a large, a largish piece, just over a metre, um, a thrown pot in different sections. Um, and what it starts to show there is that the lines that I start to introduce in the throwing, um, and then just using white slip, dragging this over the surface to enhance those marks. And those are some of the slides I'll show in a minute, where it gives me the opportunity straight away that I've thrown something to start interacting with the work. And I then start to see that that's when the conversation for me starts to take place with the work when I can start using the slip. And when people talk about things being therapeutic or meditative in a process, for me, I could, I could, I could paint slip onto a surface almost all day long um, because you start to, you're, you're adding. And again, in ceramics, we talk about ceramics tends to be, when you're hand building, tends to be an additive process. Not many makers start to subtract you know they always think about putting on a layer and then joining things together and, and building up this composition i mean we saw a fantastic example of that in linda sawmin's work earlier where it's this addition of things and more things and layering um just extraordinary kind of liveliness to those pieces and it's very rare we start to subtract but the lovely thing about slip is you can start to subtract areas while you're in the process of adding and building up different sorts of textures. Um, 
And I would always encourage students when we tell them to do something, ask us why, and then say, well, if, if you don't agree with this, try something else, do it differently. Uh, when I asked one of my tutors, um, a guy called Nick Homicky, I said, can I add, can I actually add slip to dry clay? And he said, no, it won't work. Just, it'll just drop off. And so I did, but I tried it on a grogged body. So quite a heavily grogged body. And what happened when it was bone dry were these extraordinary cracks started appearing as it was drying. But it held on and it held on through the firing as well. So it's that thing that, you know, ceramics is built on this tradition that will tell you the, the kind of things that we know will work. But also it's up to you to expand and extend that. This is students amongst you. Um, to say, OK, why doesn't that work? And have, it, have a go yourself and try. So what I found was this, um, and it's this great thing about crazed surfaces. When, it, when we talk about crazing, it's often as a fault. But if we talk about crackle, that's an intention. So, it's, um, so for me, it becomes a technique, this kind of crackle surface. Uh, and then all I've done to enhance that is rub in a black wash over it and again that gives me another opportunity to start responding to the throne lines that i've enhanced again once again i'm i'm enhancing and thinking about how can i draw out the qualities of the the work i've done with the slip and that's really just to put on a wash and wash a lot of that off um it's a stoneware wash so this stuff goes outside very happy to live outside um and then with the same black wash then treating that as a painting really so these become, you know, the pots become canvases. Um, the next slide, please, Gus. Um, and there you see just some close-ups of the same thing. So, so for me, it's, you know, I was always interested in the 80s in, in abstract expressionism. Um, and for me, it's about where the mark starts and not, you know, starting the mark before the pot and ending it two meters beyond it or something, or allowing it to trickle down. So. Um, all sorts of different ways of treating it. Um, the next slide, number 11, uh, is again, just showing some surface detail. And so the surface detail is there in the clay and the throwing, but for me, the slip again is to draw those qualities out, um, really to enhance what would be quite a dull surface if I just left it. Um, and then when I've tried glazing, it, it, the glaze just hides the body so again, it, it's, it's this in-between stage of actually just trying to enhance it. Um, next slide, number 12. Uh, different kind of, well, similar form. It was based on bottle ovens of Stoke-on-Trent. And then number 13 is, is just showing um, about how the slip starts to pick up marks that I've made in the clay through either Scrofito. So again, putting the white slip on and then scratching through that and then building more layers up over that um, for me is the exciting part about decoration. It's that thing about, um, yeah, it's where I said earlier, it's about having a conversation with the object. And that for me is where it's, it, it becomes um, an exciting moment. And then the rest of the process, it's just about taking it through the, the firing process. Um, and then the next slide, one I showed last week very quickly, um, really just to express what you can do in, with slip um, that you can't, I don't think, do with any other material in, in ceramics. And that's this incredible expressive movement, almost like this wormhole um, that Dylan Bowen um, has done. And he, it was interesting with Dylan because he studied fine art at Camberwell, he was a painter. And because his dad was a pottery, kind of, you know, new, new pots, his dad, Clive Bowen, um, quite a traditional potter, always interested in brushwork, though, on surfaces. Um, and it was just a natural thing, I guess, for Dylan to go back into the studio, into his dad's studio, um, and start seeing how his painting translated then into clay. So I don't think he actually touched clay while he was at college, um, but it was great. Again, somebody that that's what I love about ceramics and 
when Claire and Linda were talking about it, this conversation you have with, with Clay and how people bring so many other things to the material. The material gives you things, but you're also testing yourself with this material. Um, so for other people coming from other disciplines, um, to find a way for themselves in clay uh, brings new things to it. So Dylan, just this way of about, like I say, about speed of line, but also that didn't happen the first time. He saw the potential of that in some things and then was able to really refine that with the consistency of slip and with the trailer uh, and the movement from the wrist. And, and that thing about how you, you know, we kind of touch on it with students, but it's don't expect marks like that just to happen. You've got to test it, but also you've got to limber up beforehand. You know, if you think of musicians, anybody who performs, uh, and again, thinking about this afternoon's conversation about the performative element, when you are making these sorts of marks, you are in a moment of performance. This activity is a performance and it's you performing with the material. Um, and so what Dylan will do with these plates, he will put about 100 on, I think there's a video somewhere online, Dylan Bowen. He'll put 100 or 50 on the floor and then he'll walk above them. So again, this thing isn't about you tentatively, tentatively sitting with a, um, a slip trailer. It's about being a distance away from things as well. So again, that thing about how you interact will get results or different results. Um, and then move on to the next slide, Gus, please. So number 15, again, just shows it. I, just think, I still think it's extraordinary every time I look at it. Um, and then the next slide, number 18, uh, the thing about slip to remember as well, you can always spray it as well. So you can put it on very thinly um, and also just using anything to hand. So John Higgins here, um, the slab piece on the right. So if we go to the next slide, I think that's Nick Arroavis. Um And what he's doing there, these are actually thrown pots that he's cut up um, and then used them in a wall piece. But what I love about Nick's work is the sensitivity of the surface, where you can see thrown lines, you can see where he's had his finger in the pot and undulated the, the clay. Um, but with the, with the softness of spraying, he's just managed to capture and create a whole new surface where it's almost like the geography of the piece. Um, so for me, it, it's, yeah, not using the brush, but also like Andy, Andy Alamar, technician, how he uses the spray gun um, to really, um, he doesn't want the brush marks. He wants the kind of clarity of the material on the surface and then rubs back into that. Um, I should have put one of Andy's pieces on here actually. Um, next slide is again just showing John Higgins and the way he uses just a, a simple paint roller um, just to kind of create a different mark that then he'll use that but then go over with different brushes. So again this layering, this layering by tools, by different techniques to create these surfaces. And then the last slide um, thinking about how I mentioned Scrofito earlier, but that moment of kind of when the clay is just the right consistency. And I think I mentioned it last week where that slide on the left, sorry, the, the, the tile on the left where I've just pulled the, the tool through the, the clay. Um, Tony mentioned the photographer saying a few times when Tony got his hands in clay, can you just hold on a minute? I just, I, and it's like, no, this is the moment. And what was extraordinary for me was that's probably the best line I've ever produced in Scrofito, where the whole uh, line is coming away in this perfect curl. Um, so it's great to capture that. And obviously some, somebody, uh, uh, an exponent of Scrofito, um, and I think what makes his pots extraordinary is just the depth of surface and why people are attracted to them. Um, and as we know, Grayson Perry literally throws the, the decorative sink at pots or his pots. And on that note, um, and my phone's still, I think I've got 
some percentage here. Oh, it's gone up to 11%, so I've done quite well. Um, so the next slide, Gus, just to end it on is, is basically stay well and stay free. So stay in. I'll just keep on reminding everybody. So thank you very much. I hope that was, uh, expresses my interest in slip. And Tony will have just thought, what is he on about? <laughs> have you ever no. used slip, Tony? Yeah, I poured it into moulds, man. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said maybe it's, this is decorating slip I'm talking about. Yeah, um, no, I use slip, actually. I quite yeah. like that, tech, that idea of that technique where you pick it up off the plaster. It's one I keep meaning to get to, actually. Because yeah, I work more in an industrial context, it tends not to be used. Yeah. It's no, good. I mean, that, that is an extra, it's a beautiful quality. But I, I always think of, when I think of slip and I think of our decorative techniques within the kind of lexicon, you know, if, why often ceramics works with printmaking in shows really well is that kind of attention to the detail of technique and surface. You know, I mean, I've had sculptor friends who just say, you know, you, you lot are mad, you're just interested in the kind of form and the, you're obsessed with the surface. And there is something about that obsession with printmakers about the exact quality of the print. You know, is it the first print off the roll or is it the fifth? Is it the hundredth? And just seeing the, the degrading, I suppose, of the quality of the, the print in a way. But it's at what stage? Yeah, so many techniques with an etching and um, dry point and all those things. I just see the similarity all the time with, with ceramics. And often when you see... Yeah, a, a, a print and a ceramic show together, it's really interesting. Um, yeah. So I don't know if anybody's got any questions. I haven't got my PowerPoint um, on the phone, folks. So Gus, that's why I've been going through the numbers. Um, I sent in that 10 minutes before, uh, before we were due to go on air because, um, yeah, I've been locked out of Zoom for some reason. Yeah, that wasn't so bad, though. No, was that all right? Yeah, that okay. Was okay. Yeah, it's okay. Good. Con do that. consumer professional, man. Yeah. Really? Yeah, you pull that Can off. Can I have that in a quote from you? <laughs> yeah, I'll put that on your next job application. <laughs> <laughs> Why, where am I going? So, <laughs> for, the, for the next one of these, are we going to try and do something where Anders and I follow through with? Yeah, that would be, that would be cool, yeah. Yeah, on that note, I was just going to say, Duncan, I like your approach with students where you put the information out there and then leave it up to them if they want to challenge, challenge it. Challenge it. But we'll try to really follow follow the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's I mean, I, I remember the same tutor saying to me, I, I was really interested in Raku when I first went to college because I, I just like building fires, basically. Yeah. You know, there, there are a certain number of ceramics people who are just pyrotechnical. You know, it's like... The pyrotechnical element of it is fantastic, Py pyromaniacs. But um, yeah, I spent about half of the year just up at the kiln site building all sorts of all sorts of kilns, and and I hadn't occurred to it because I was told that you couldn't raku fire porcelain. And then it was only about three months later I thought, well, why can't you? What what why why can't we try that? Uh, and as you know, it works perfectly. You know, so it was all this thing about, I suppose, Paul Solman, you know, really, he, he was the great Raku person in, in the States who uh, British potters really followed in this country, went over to work with him. And it was through him, really, that Raku was introduced into our college in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and the kind of visceral spectacle of, of Raku fire. Um, but it, it's really interesting how these rules start to become you know, they, they almost often don't become challenged. I did. I yeah. say, I, when I taught the Royal College, um, me and Jackie Ponsela used to do this project together and um, we'd get the students to this briefing. So, you know, you'd sort of come in and on your first day of term or the first, yeah, first couple of days, the students would make a presentation of their practice and we'd make someone record it, you know, like write it down, write some notes and we'd say, you, you just, you write down what they say and write down the feedback so they've got a complete yeah. and we've we've spin up this yarn about like you need to write down what they say because often people aren't really tracking what they're saying in that moment. 
And then what we did is once everyone had gone, said, actually, whatever you have in front of you is now your project for a month. <laughs> and so, but I remember, um, so I won't name him, but I remember somebody who, who was like f- freaked out because he like, I'd never used porcelain before. And I was like, it's just clay, man. Why are you, what's your problem? And he's like, oh yeah, but I've always, you know, used terracotta or something. I was like, he said, oh, it's porcelain. Is so, it's like, just, it's just clay. Get on with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it's, I, I always think it's important to be challenged and to challenge the subject, for goodness sake. Otherwise, we just stay, we stay still. We stay still, we stay stagnant, we don't move forward. And I think that's the great thing at the moment for, for our subject is a lot of other people are interested in it. You know, I don't know if it's the same over in the States, but, you know, we've, we've got people now picking up clay in different disciplines for the first time. Yeah, you know, ma- major artists. I mean, we know Anthony Gormley's always had a love of clay. People like Anish Kapoor have used it. Richard Deacon, um, you know, Andy Goldsworthy, Richard Longsley. We can go, you know, people assume it's just fine artists at the moment to discover this again. But actually, if you look back at the last 20, 30 years, it's always been, it's never, it's never been hidden as a material. Um, it's just that a lot of a lot of artists have discovered it oh, again. Just, fine artists. Can you turn the lights on for me? <laughs> yeah, t- Tony's Tony's going into midnight zone. Yeah. Just had to get the lights turned on. I was like, completely... ah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I realised that uh, my daughter was in the kitchen. And I was like, turn the lights on. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so yeah, I don't know if, yeah, I, I hope that was um, in depth enough about slip. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. And for me, for me, it's just sometimes to be reminded because no matter how long you've been in a subject or practice, um, sometimes you just need to be shown things again, or one word can suddenly think, "Ah, oh, yeah, okay, I need to pick, I need to have a look at that again." Yeah, because we we sometimes can go so narrow in our practices. I'm excited to to work through some of these things for you guys because it, it's been a long time since someone given has given me an assignment to do or like told me yeah, right. yeah so i'm looking forward to this this will be fun yeah. uh, we're happy to give assignments <laughs> yeah um cool well so we'll be back uh, at some point next week to do anders and gus try and do what tony and duncan are talking about um, okay yeah we'll just see how good our instruction is then, yeah. won't we? <laughs> I used to, I used to long time ago, I used to do demonstrations where like, you know, we'd get one of the audience to do, and just talk them through it and be like, you know, and it was about like confidence building. So you sort of exactly what you're describing or someone had asked a question, okay, you, you come and do it. I'm like, yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's what we're about to do, I think. <laughs> yeah, be great. Um, I'll look forward to it. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Tony and Duncan. This was great. And thanks everybody that joined. Um, We'll be doing more again next week. So, great. Cool. Thank you. Will do. Take care now. Take it easy. See ya. Bye. Good night.